Hello everybody and welcome to this video where we are going to talk about Bukowski because that seems to be the only thing I'm talking about now because I have or am finishing up or in the process of reading three books two about him and one about him Ugh, it's funny how things just kind of happen I guess all right, <clears throat> so I think I've done a video on this book before, but it was um, probably two years ago or so. Um, so again, for those of you who don't remember, the reason why I flag books the way I do is that these poems here are poems that I like. These flags here are lines that I like. But then I just started getting crazy writing in the book, and um, so I kind of stopped doing the flags, and I would, like, just draw in the book. Now, um, I have thoughts about Mr. Kowski's output, and this is what they are. Everything pre-1980, okay, has a different feel than everything in between 1980 and 1994, Everything after 1994 has another completely different feeling because his shit was completely edited and butchered and um, rewritten, okay? Um, and I've talked about that before on the channel. If you have questions about that, let me know down below. And if the questions are stuff that I haven't gone over, I'll do a video about how all that shit went down but so we basically have three Bukowskis when it comes to poetry we have the poor um, almost homeless man of the people who was trying really hard to be accepted by the literati okay through the um, 60s, like even from the stuff that he first got published in like Story and Matrix and shit like that from way back when. We have that Bukowski. And then I think it starts to really change around the time of Play the Piano Like a Percussion Instrument came out. You see glimpses of what his 80s output is going to be like in that book, even though a lot of that book is stuff that didn't make it into the prior couple books. But then when you get to the 80s, and I have to really think about Dangling in the Torch of book, because that one is kind of a weird little outlier. But you have War All the Time, and you have Dangling, and you have this one. I think that's the order they came out. Let me check real quick. Um, play the Piano Drunk was 79. Dangling was 81. War All the Time was 84. And this was 86. So, yeah. Dangling has some elements, and probably it would be safer to say Dangling and Play the Piano Drunk are kind of like one book, as far as this theory goes. But War All the Time, and I'm going through that again right now too. So War All the Time, I think, is the first time we really see the successful Bukowski we see him, um, like, it's so funny, I'm doing a video on this book, but we're sitting here talking about war all the time. The first poem in War All the Time is about how the people in um, Germany reacted to him as a celebrity, okay? And that's a far cry from the shit in The Days Run Away Like Horses or Mockingbird Wish Me Luck or um, Love is a Dog from Hell. 
you know, it's a complete, or burning in water as well. Like, it's a completely different fucking feel. The other thing that happens around war all the time and you get so alone, although I noticed it more in this book than I did in war all the time, you don't see him trying to get the acceptance from the university crowd in this book like you used to from his books in the 70s. And when you take that out of his work, his work is so much more pleasurable to read because he's not shoehorning in a bunch of random shit that doesn't fit in the poem. And that's the funny thing, because most of the poems that he's known for, like The Genius of the Crowd or Tragedy of the Leaves, poems like that, where the whole poem is about something, um, something important to him. And then at the end of the poem, he starts talking about hemlock and shit like that. Or... um, that poem where fuck what poem is it and it ends with like a metaphor or no it's more of a simile I guess of uh, six herons standing on the water kind of thing like just shit that like seems forced because The whole poem is talking in a certain voice. And then he'll throw this shit in there. And I used to feel a lot of that was also the way he talked about classical music. Because I feel like his knowledge of classical music made him feel superior, at least to the people in his circles. And hopefully showed that he was a sophisticated gentleman, in quotes, to the people of the upper echelon circles. And for a long time, I thought that that was the only reason why he talked about that shit. But by the time we get into these books in the 80s, he's been listening to classical music for so long that of course he's going to fucking talk about it because he listens to it all the time. And he listened to it all the time before. But the difference is, when he talks about it in the 80s, he's not doing it to impress anybody. And again, like you're like, well, how do you know if he was doing it to impress anybody? I don't know. It was just a feeling I got. But when he writes about classical music in the 80s, it just seems like something he's talking about because of something he's experiencing. Okay? And, like, another thing that was really difficult for me to grasp for a long time was I fucking hate it. And this is, like, total New York school poetry fucking bullshit and beat shit, too. Dropping names of other poets is, like, the thing you do. And if you drop names, maybe someday someone will drop your name and then you're a poet and all that crap. Um, and I always hated that. And so when Bukowski would do that, I would always think to myself, I'm like, why are you fucking lowering yourself to that fucking shit, dude? Like, you don't have to fucking do that. But the other thing that came to me when I was reading through this was that the way Bukowski wrote, he wrote quick. He was very prolific. And he would write stuff and send it off to magazines. So a lot of times when he would be name dropping somebody, a lot of it had to do with the fact that he was doing this in response to something he just read in another magazine or something somebody told him about somebody. And so he would dash off a poem and send it to a publisher and go, can't wait for that thing to fucking come out and get in everyone's craw. And it's just like when I fucking do videos on here and I start fucking yelling and screaming and bitching about somebody on fucking YouTube, you know, that was his outlet to do that kind of shit. So it's one of those things where being able to understand the situation 
that a poem was written in gives you better context as to why a poem like that was written in the first place. I'm not into the idea of knowing everything about why a po poet wrote a poem makes you be able to understand the poem better. I don't like that. But the idea of knowing if a poem was a response to something helps. You know, it helps. Why the fuck did you even do that? So anyway, so that's just my soapbox. Let me see. Are there any poems in here I would like to read out? Just some good lines in here. Some men never die and some men never live. I like that. It's when you're on the row that you notice that everything is owned and that there are locks on everything. All she wants is what she always wanted, only it's getting further and further away. As the junkies junk, as the alkies drink, as the horrors horror, as the killer kills, the albatross blinks its eye, the weather stays mostly the same. Nothing matters, and we know nothing matters, and that matters. I like that too. I'm just going to read this whole poem. It's called Rift. I know I've read this poem on this channel before. I can't live with you anymore, she said. Look at you. Huh? I asked. Look at you. Sitting in that goddamn chair, your belly is sticking out of your underwear. You've burnt cigarette holes in all your shirts. All you do is suck on that goddamn beer, bottle after bottle. What do you get out of that? The damage has been done, I told her. What are you talking about? Nothing matters, and we know nothing matters, and that matters. You're drunk. Come on, baby, let's get along. It's easy. Not for me, she screamed. Not for me. She ran into the bathroom, put on her makeup. I got up for another beer. Sat back down, just had a new bottle to my mouth when she came out of the bathroom. Holy shit, she screamed, you're disgusting. I laughed right into the bottle, gagged, spit a mouthful of beer across my undershirt. My God, she said. She slammed the door and was gone. I looked at the closed door and at the doorknob, and strangely, I didn't feel alone. I just, I fucking love that. Love, love, love that. Here's a short one. Miracle. I have just listened to this symphony which Mozart dashed off in one day, and it had enough wild and crazy joy to last forever. Whatever forever is. Mozart came as close as possible to that. Defeat can strengthen just as victory can weaken. That's great. I fucking love that too. The courage it took to get out of bed each morning, to face the same things over and over, was enormous. And this poem here, this is, uh, this is for Alan over at uh, Big Hard books and classics <sighs> oh shit there ain't nothing nowhere he said and it's getting to be less than nothing all the time I like that agony sometimes changes form but it never ceases for anybody once great thoughts often with time become useless and stupid I like that the price of creation is never too high. The price of living with other people always is. Goddamn. Oh, what matters most is how well you walk through the fire. Yeah, that's good. As the half-light moves toward me like motherfucking death, I give up the battle. Like, I think you could find out a lot about a person by going through any collection of poetry they have on their bookshelf and go through it and see what lines they have marked or underlined or something. Because I'm seeing a pattern here in this book. So like this one right here. 
So I let them have their little victories, which they need far more than I do. What's, what's this say about me? Take a writer away from his typewriter, and all you have left is the sickness which started him typing in the beginning. Goddamn. Goddamn, goddamn, goddamn. Having nothing to struggle against, they have nothing to struggle for. So those are all the lines I have marked. The poems in this, I might read some of them on um, the members bit um, for like basic crew folk. But um, yeah, I'm not going to sit here and read all of this. Um, that's a lot of stuff. I think what you have to decide is what Bukowski you want. Because even the poems about the time before he was writing, like when he writes about Jane and he writes about the 10 year drunk and all that other shit. The way he writes about it in the eighties compared to how he writes about it in the sixties and seventies, it's a completely different, it's a, it's, it's different. It just is. So even though the stuff that made him famous came out in the seventies, um, I think he has more amazing poetry in the eighties than he did in the 70s. But the ones that did hit, hit really hard and were great. So um, I recommend this book if you want to try it. Los Angeles. Pick it up in my Etsy shop. Link's down below. So with that said, everybody, keep buying my books. I'll talk to you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Creo and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.